Well, it's, uh, it's a pleasure for me and a challenge for me to talk about this topic. Um, gig sharing economy, I said gig sharing economy, uh, the value chains or poverty chains, uh, challenges posed uh, by digitization in the context of globalization. Now, uh, gig sharing economy, I put it in uh, for, for special reason into this uh, in, in this way, uh, because it's actually not really clear if it's some people say gig, share, uh, gig economy or sharing economy or collaborative economy. There are so many different uh, terms being used um, that it is somewhat, well, th this, this is a difficulty in its own terms. Now, another difficulty is that we are talking actually about uh, the rich, the G20, the rich countries uh, just concluding the meeting in Hamburg uh, here and uh, one of the slogans have been shaping a new there was no way of sharing and what had been on sharing was as far as sharing played a role uh, it was sharing amongst a few uh, the contradiction being there that uh, on the one hand it is uh, the largest economic power uh, globally, at the same time in terms of representation uh, it is not. So uh, there is a special focus, it's not the entire, uh, not, not about the entire uh, issue of, of digitization, digit, uh, digital economy, uh, but this is the, the main topic uh, in the background. Still, I want to focus first a little bit on the global context, uh, where we are actually uh, looking at this uh, issue of uh, digitization, uh, and then the, uh, look as well uh, at the political implications in terms of the st statutory system, uh, meaning what does it mean for the state, for the constitution of the state, and then really going uh, in sometimes even technical terms uh, looking at the questions of um, the economic side, the value side uh, that is implied. Uh, just the context as I said. We are right now July 2017. In May 2016 there was another summit, the World Humanitarian Summit, held in Istanbul. So this uh, World Humanitarian Summit uh, was a United Nations event and was organized in Istanbul in May 2016. In July of the same year there was the attempted military coup d'etat and in April 2017 there was the referendum aiming on a strengthened position, to say the least, of Erdogan and his AKP. And Erdogan, AKP in, indirectly, Turkey as one um, representative of the G G20 are now gathering to shape this world. Back to the human, uh, World human, Humanitarian uh, Summit. The central document uh, is a so-called Grand Bargain, a collective self-obligation that would allow for less bureaucratic, faster help. And it was mainly, even if it was a global event really by the United Nations, it was mainly about the implementation of humanitarian aid. So these are the two core issues, implementation, humanitarian aid. Germany adding 10 million euro to the United Nations Development Fund. If we relate this to the GDP, we would usually say it's peanuts. Now, as I said, there is at least brief look uh, necessary to look at the state. And the state is still the central category uh, when it comes to talking about the political issues, about the world system. We are talking about states, nation states, and at the same time 
looking at specific, more specific states, not in terms of nationality, but in terms of the understanding of the state, there's always in the context of the digitization uh, a, tre a trend to talk nowadays about welfare for zero, meaning adapting the welfare state, the old welfare state, uh, to the modern uh, means of technology to or, or this uh, recent more or less recent development. So there is as well the idea of welfare after the crisis. And when we look at the issue of the welfare state, welfare after the crisis, there is uh, it is at least about three issues. It's the trickle down effect. So if the tide, the rising tide lifts all boats, uh, or if, if, if the tide is rising, it lifts all boats, so there's always something for everybody in it. It's about spreading widely uh, the entire issues uh, of um, welfare provision, of wealth, of, of well-being, whatsoever. And then we have, which is another form of saying it, uh, the elevator effect meaning everybody will be in a better position as long as the entire state system uh, is increasing its wealth. Now, welfare state, competitive states are the more or less traditional issues uh, that we know from more or less recent uh, uh, discussions. And I say more or less because we are talking about uh, actually the last uh, 50 years, 60 years, and all this developed. Different terms, different contexts coming here or, or being um, in, in this context of G20 and Hamburg. Uh, it is the European integration, of course, the European welfare state, the social state. There are differences. Nevertheless, there is this consensus. Welfare state, the new consensus was then the competitive state. Uh, very much linked to this uh, concept of um, uh, advantage for everybody, the trickle-down effect. And then we are arriving now at a new concept, which is the investment state. The investment state seems to be something new in so far that we are actually dealing with the idea of investment as a matter of social policy, as a matter of social investment, but as well as a new form of, co um, of corporate social responsibility, which is important in another respect, mainly in the respect of privatizing political It is not the traditional Back to the question digitization. Uh, if we look at the numbers, it is actually a relatively small number that is really affected by the entire uh, thing that is called a new trend that is dominating uh, already now and definitely in the near future the entire economy the sharing economy, the gig economy. These are concepts that are, of course, important, but nevertheless, uh, there is a trend to overestimate what it actually means. It is about this uh, sharing economy, gig economy, in the strict sense, but it is as well in terms of the number of jobs. It is as well in uh, respect of the internet access. We think in some parts of the societies, in some strata, we think, well, this is everybody has access to internet, everybody uses all these modern devices and gadgets. But um, I heard recently a figure, uh, even in a city of, as, as New York, um, there are 8 million, 8.5 million people living and 3 million have no access to broadband no access at all. So even in such a place, in such a center place, we see this huge uh, divergence uh, and, and the digital split. 
Now, the question is not only looking simply at the figures, but all this what we have today, uh, all this what we use in terms of broadband and uh, all these things is a little bit like um, the old use of the computer or pros pro pro most likely even today the use of the computer as intelligent typewriter. Um, we are not really uh, using the full capacities of uh, any computer that is on the market today. <clears throat> as well, coming to the, to the quantity, to the meaning uh, of digital uh, economy, the main uh, jobs, the <clears throat> main section uh, on the labor market is still with traditional jobs it's in the industrial, traditional industrial production. We should never forget this when we talk about the small, at the end, small area. And we have to say as well that wherever we go in the so-called developed economies, in the so-called developing or emerging com uh, com uh, uh, countries or economies, we find this huge gap between rich and poor. We find possibly in the same house where we work, where we may have good jobs, well-paid jobs, uh, we might find, may find the, the caretaker who actually does not have or hardly has enough to get by. We, looking from or working towards the more economic perspective, I think we have to be more concise, more succinct uh, when it comes to working on these issues. Not just using these terms in a very broad way, but really looking at the specific meaning uh, and the specific understanding of the different dimensions. Sharing, gig, collaborative, disruptive. And with all these issues, we have the central question of quid pro quo. Who gains from it and for what is this game. The other side, the economy. We say sharing economy, gig economy, collaborative economy, uh, but then sometimes we say actually it is collaborative consumption or co-production. And I think we have to be really very aware of it to develop a system that allows us to look at the different perspectives of the economy. It is consumption, it is production in the strict sense, in the narrow sense, it is distribution, it is exchange, and there is, of course, or there are, of course, differences in the reality and in the paradigms we use. In the reality means we are dealing with a variety of countries, even here in, uh, in, in the context of G20. Overall, on the global level, these G20, the 20 richest, most advanced countries, are a small part of approximately 200 countries on the globe. Actually, the number seems to be not exactly clear. It's 195 or 196, depending on who you uh, deal. Uh, look at who you include. In any case, they, we are dealing with aggregate data, and aggregate data by their very nature deny any difference in many respects. Also, in many respects of what I just mentioned, the economic dimensions. The economic power, in stricto sensu, measured usually in GDP, in the output, is only smart, a small part, even if we look at the economy in the wider sense. And still, if we work with it, we are always or frequently surprised. We find ourselves, we find new identities that are built by these networks. I'm part of 
uh, or member, but I don't know actually even if, or how would you call it, um, of these different systems, the different social networks in terms of research uh, networks or professional uh, networks. It is amazing. You find different statistics. Um, there is an amazing degree of exchange between the different uh, uh, platforms uh, without that we know who reads the small print. I don't want to contest that there is any or, or say that there is any legal, uh, legal issue around it. There may well be, but who reads all the small print? And sometimes it's funny um, if I look at the jobs I'm getting uh, a job offers. This could be of interest for you. Um, it's funny what should or could be according to their data interesting. So apparently all this builds in somewhat funny, sometimes funny, uh, new identity. And of course it is hugely influencing as well in terms of advertisement and and and. All this is more or less um, known we are kind of aware of it, even if we, by and large, uh, ignore it. And the same is true when it comes to certain figures in terms of feedback or something like this. Uh, book reviews with five stars or minus five stars, well, they don't exist. Uh, but then you see in this, again, kind of small prints based on 10 reviews. This is for a global review. What does it mean? 10 reviews is more or less nothing. Then you find high numbers somewhere, and you may believe them until you hear about click farms where you can actually buy for money your clicks. And this is the Matthew principle um, where if you have, you will get more. The state. Welfare state. Again, this issue. And this is an issue of the market standing we have, be it as uh, employers or employees or in terms of security. Uh, there is always a label put on our existence. It had been the good the deserving poor and the undeserving poor. We may be a little bit more different, differentiated now. We have all these means here as well in place. And we have it even more. The Frederick Ebert uh, Foundation uh, has a publication uh, on the way to welfare for zero. And then there is another title. Um, it's a European uh, research project, WWW, Welfare Wealth Work Project. And there they say as well, it is about the need to welfare state adjustment to new social risks. Breathing. The new social risks are those in the post-crisis scenario. So there is a conflict in these discussions. Now, coming to the more fundamental issues, uh, looking at the, the, the system of these G20 countries, just briefly running through it, really, um, something we all know, more or less, we are not really aware of it, that it is really something that is hugely contemplated, uh, uh, always uh, talking about. Capitalism. It's individualist, it's utilitarian. It is about the competition and opportunity cost uh, that are the focus of the entire system. The social, as far as it is uh, considered, um, is constituted by the price as a matter of exchange of equivalence and it is, again, competition on the market and by a comparative advantage. Free trade is another important element. Even if it is contested nowadays, it is in general part of the entire idea. Equivalence exchange internationally now with free trade 
again, competitive, uh, comparative advantage. Comparative advantage is not a win-win situation, it is a competitive system. And then we are talking about the world society of, of equals when it comes to the ideal of uh, the capitalism with checks and balances via the market and via separation of power. Let's look a little bit more at the details of what capitalism is really about. It's a world system, and the world system is, as we know from Wallerstein, from Amigune Frank, from many others, it is a system that is based on power and inequality. It is international and non-utilitarian. There is, of course, the idea of having uh, some utilitarian uh, uh, guidelines, but it is not the nation-state competing with others on the basis of utility exchange, but it is international non-utilitarian. The gainification is based on exchange value, not on use value. So this is a very important point. Looking at a definition, a classical definition of um, economics, economics is the science which studies human behavior as a relationship between given ends and scarce means which have alternative uses. I read this because it is from a textbook, from a standard textbook uh, I used here in China over the last uh, years. And then we have political economy, or economics is a study of mankind in ordinary business of life. It examines the part, that part of individual and social action, which is most closely connected with the attainment and with the use of the material requisites of well-being. Thus, it is on the one side a study of wealth, and on the other and more important side, a part of the study of men. Something we usually do not consider as important uh, when we are teaching economics, when we are working as economists. Rational, informed actors, scarcity, cost-benefit, incentives matters and comparative advantages are the relevant parts that play a role to determine exchange on the market. But actual, in actual fact, the entire economy, in the wider sense of the definition I just uh, read, is about exchange, of course, it is about subsistence, and it is about market production. Again, usually when we talk about these issues, we are more or less sloppy, we are more or less generous in using these terms. There are certain paradigms uh, that I tried to figure out and uh, they should show up here now, exactly. Uh, it's not about the details, uh, but it gives us an idea that we focused increasingly on marginalism, the second half of the 19th century, uh, which is a specific theory, a specific uh, um, paradigm that actually says the market, the exchange on the market is the most crucial thing where value is determined, where value is actually uh, emerging. It's via exchange. And only after this focus, we find a more differentiated approach with institutional economics, with behavioral economics, with social choice playing a role. And all this, in a way, one can say, reapproaching the questions we had been fading out before. Because if we look at classical political economy, there we find it all in an integrated way. The founding fathers, as far as I'm aware, there was not really a founding mother, 
uh, of which which wouldn't be of surprise, the founding fathers had not been necessarily um, what we would say today. Uh, this is an economist, moral philosophers, political scientists, lawyers, jurisprudence, and all this. Coming then from there and developing this system uh, of economy, of economics, including uh, some medical doctors like Kinney. Anyway, so we have this focus, we have the widening again, and then we have, of course, the Marxist political economy uh, that always was at the sideline, um, as Keynes said, it's in the underground where uh, the, the wider issues um, survived. And it is about political economy as well, the Volkswirtschaftslehre, the wider political economy uh, that prevailed with Max Weber, uh, with Zombart and uh, others, who always have been aware of the importance of these things. And of course, there was in or within these uh, areas as well uh, specific, uh, specialization uh, when it comes then to the theory of regulation, world systems theory, uh, and the like. So, it is important to keep this in mind and to say, with this, we have the wider approach, sorry, the wider approach that we are concerned with a complex system of an accumulation regime, which is consumption and production working hand in hand together and establishing a system that is really about uh, making the best or the most money out of it, making a profitable economy. This is linked to a mode of regulation where we have statutory bodies, where we have systems of regulations, law and, and, and property structures uh, that are providing this consensus, a political consensus, an institutional consensus, going hand in hand with something that I called uh, mode of life, the general consensus uh, linked to lifestyles, lived, linked to expectations we have to live, uh, to, to live and how we live, uh, the normative systems, and then in terms of the living regime, the way we uh, work with it and we are actually uh, trying to make sense out of it um, for ourselves in our daily life. All this is, of course, about a wider issue. Uh, namely, it is about the issue of how we actually live in society. You can go back to Aristotle, and uh, it, it was going through the entire social thinking uh, of, of very different proveniences uh, where we have the social defined by the Social Quality Foundation or International Association now uh, as an outcome of the interaction between people constituted as actors and their constructed as a natural environment. Its subject matter refers to people's interrelated productive and reproductive relationships. This is an important, I think, to keep it in mind that we are uh, looking at a wider issue even, and we, we have to keep this in, in mind, even if we are doing all these calculations about looking at specific issues in the economy. The one problem with all this is, of course, that these wider issues, even in the more or less narrow understanding of the economy is about the environmental question. It is about the meaning of work. It is about overcoming life-threatening inequality, as we see today again. And it is not only the immediate poverty in material terms, but it is as well about the loss of identity, the loss of integrity of personalities. Entities then in the wider understanding 
of government and governance, what it is, uh, is uh, or how it is called today. All these terms are, of course, difficult in their own terms, and we have to make the differentiated analysis. Um, but it is important uh, when we talk about uh, the issues of how actually society shapes or reshapes today in the age of a new, seemingly new productive force developing with this um, digital mix. When I look at mode of life and the, the living regimes, um, it is of course as well about the, the reaching from the hello effect, uh, establishing this vanity fair to violence. It's this matter of integrity of personalities. It is uh, something where, of course, I referred for a specific reason to this hello effect and, and the vanity fair. Um, it's, it's a kind of soft method uh, with these gossip journals, uh, hello and, and vanity fair, soft methods of integrating people, backing uh, in, a, in a perverse way this excessive wealth of a tiny, tiny minority. And those who have not are even satisfied by seeing all this glamour. It is motivating in some way uh, as well the Protestant work ethics of just try, push yourself, be self-responsible uh, to move in the same way. You feel guilty as being unemployed even uh, if, if, you, if, if the uh, unemployment rate is very high. And especially there, gig economy, entrepreneurship, uh, sharing, all this plays a role of distracting from the own, from the real uh, problems. Just a quote from Joseph Schumpeter. In its full vitality, it meant individual contracting regulated by individual choice between an indefinite number of possibilities. That's the old contract he talks about, the traditional, the, the, the from where it comes, what I said, this is the ideal of capitalism. The stereotype, unindividual, impersonal and bureaucratized contract of today, this applies much more generally. But a potiori, we may fasten upon the labor contract, which presents but restricted freedom of choice and mostly turns on set apprendre ou laisser, has none of the old features, the most important of which become impossible with giant concerns dealing with other giant concerns or impersonal masses of workmen or consumers. The void is being filled by tropical growth of new legal structures and a little reflection shows that this could hardly be otherwise. And there you see that the capitalist process pushes into the background all those institutions, the institutions of property and free contracting in particular, that express the needs and ways of the truly private economic activity. This is the real capitalism. This is what we are talking about and this is the reality that is different from the ideal we always hear. Of course there are many interesting discussions and possible strengths we can go. What does it mean actually in terms of law? Uh, there we have this development from status to contract. Um, from community to society, we turn this in terms of sociology, do we actually retreat? Do we go back to status, to uh, informal relationships? If you are in, if you are in the gated community, you are part of it. If not, back up. And it is about capitalists 
without actually being capitalist, without having capital as mean as a productive, productively invested uh, means. So in this way, I'm wondering, is it correct to say that we are witnessing the innovation of the contradiction of neoliberalism? Or isn't it more the contradiction of capitalism in general, not neoliberalism, but neoliberalism being a failed solution? Neoliberalism is saying, uh, as, as such, is a strange amalgamation of policies. Denying people's rights and also people's rights in terms of people's rights, individuals' rights, and the rights of people. And it is gaining and maintaining a populist image. Always think it's fi uh, funny if you look at, for instance, the American president now, um, he being populist, with I don't know how much, how much money he has, and he did, definitely did not get by simple hard personal labor. Anyway, leaving this aside, uh, I want to come now to the question of um, capital. Simply, we have the following picture. We have the two parts of capital. It's the C and V, the constant capital and the variable capital. And the organic composition that is linked to it means that the increase of C actually reduces the rate of profit. Reduces the rate of profit means you may, and this is the idea of increasing actually the uh, organic composition, you may get more money, you may get more profit in absolute terms, but the rate of profit is decreasing. So the more differentiated picture is uh, C-fixed, and C circulating um, related to V plus S, meaning surplus, which is part of the V. And then you have an even more uh, differentiated uh, figure that is at the bottom line uh, C fixed uh, plus C circulating related to capitalized and decapitalized parts of. V, uh, of, of v and S. I think this is an important uh, and often neglected difference uh, that we have actually uh, the, the, the problem that we speak of capital and that at the same time part of this capital is not really capital, meaning it's not part of the, uh, the, the process of capitalism in this case. Now, returning to the theory of value, we are talking about the total value that equals the price. That is something that is relevant on the level of, uh, in, in the model. It is applicable on the level of the firm, of the individual enterprise. It is relevant for the sectors. It is relevant for the department one and two in particular, meaning where we have the production of means of uh, production and the means of uh, consumption. It is a matter of total value equals price uh, in the model on the national level on and globally. Which seems to be honest, a little bit magic. How to get all these balances done of course, not every day, every second, but in the short run, in the medium run, uh, we have, of course, the uh, different aspects of crisis, where we have the clearance processes. Um, but more important is, I think, to look at how exactly this process of capitalization and decapitalization 
that takes place. We still have the three major elements. It's the commons, that something that belongs to us all, that actually does not belong to anybody, but it is still there. We have the private, and this is in both cases linked to some form of goods. And I'm talking now about goods, not about commodities. But this is the process of commodification that we find then. That we find the two stages of commodification, the first being the primitive accumulation, the accumulation through dispossession, uh, taking away public property, encapsulating, enclosing something that there is, is there for everybody. And at the same time, we find the permanent process of commodification as part of production. We are producing commodities with the commodities we always already have. Nevertheless, we have to think as well to find the balance, to find uh, a kind of balancing system. We have to think as uh, about decommodification as well. The commodification can be considered as a model for a very limited number of actors with equal status. As we don't find it, we need certain mechanisms of decommodification that are condition and result of this process. Here I would suggest again two uh, strands, two perspectives. The one being decommodification as a matter of statutory deliveries. Uh, this had been brought up um, in connection with the welfare state of decommodification of labor, uh, meaning it is not the money you get on, you, you have to gain by your income on the labor market, by labor, but it is something that, is, uh, that, that uh, the, the state provides for. It's education, it's social services, it's health services, uh, di different issues there. Um, Depending on, on certain conditions, it may be depend on certain conditions on eligibility or it may be there for everybody. Now we have a second stage, I would say, which is not really new but existed also for a long time, but a second layer, if you want, of decommodification, which is about shifting to the private households, to individuals the amount of DIY that is undertaken as a matter of decommodification, for different reasons. We have decommodification um, as well of uh, the, the many different things, preparing meals, again, uh, gardening, uh, private health care in terms of looking after yourself, trying to uh, follow a living high, uh, lifestyle, what, what sort of, there, there are many different things. We have to keep in mind that this is a different form of decommodification. Taking things out of the market or keeping them out of the market, not allowing the market taking over. And this is of course something we find in connection with healthcare, uh, where we find exactly this uh, fight in a way uh, the best medicine for the best people and at the same time the best advice is still from the grandmother, from those people who are knowing about the local conditions, who are knowing about the herbs, who are uh, knowing actually about lifestyles as well and about life. And the life is about use value, if we want to come back or remain in, in uh, economic terms. It is about use value and not about exchange value. Whereas this had been, of course, turned around. Uh, today's economy, many statements can be found for it, are about exchange value, use value only in the second place. There is an interesting um, passage coming back to uh, Schumpeter, where he actually states similarly 
as we have seen in the preceding chapter, the opportunities for enterprise afforded by new areas to be exploited were certainly unique, but only in the sense in which all opportunities are. It is gratuitous to assume that not only the closing of the friendship will cause a vacuum, but also what that, that whatever steps into the vacant place must uh, be necessarily uh, less important in any of the senses. We may choose to give to that word. And now I think there is a very important part that is or makes sense uh, immediately today. The conquest of the air may well be more important than the conquest of Indian wars. We must not confuse geographical frontiers with economic ones. And this is exactly this process of privatization, privatizing everything, but in this case it is commodification, and at the same time we find this process as decommodification in terms of look after yourself. So far, exchange and use value. The other dimension that is important is the one between production and exchange. All the different paradigms, economic pr paradigms I referred to before, have been not least about, uh, around this issue, production, production and exchange. What is produced, the value that is produced, and the value that is um, adapted, adopted, captured on the market. And this is the important point. The value that is value added as matter of production and the price as the matter of value captured. We can come back in detailed analysis, Ricardo, comparative advantage, Babbage, uh, Babbage Charles Babbage, uh, with his economy of machinery and manufacturing, saying, um, it is on the global and the local level the determining of the value as public-private use. And it is about the division of labor as a matter of the greatest advantage for the few. There is, it is a, a zero-sum game. We should not um, try to look over this and, and to fade this out. It is a zero-sum game as long as we are not really looking at the meaning of global and local. It is a zero-sum game as long as we are not looking at uh, the, the, the value in a different dimension, namely in the dimension of public and private in terms of use and in terms of the production. And with this, I come at one important point uh, in connection of the digitization discussion. Data, I think, are commons, are kind of natural commons. And it is, I think, strange that we are talking about data as private goods. They are produced commonly by the commons, by all of us, and they are used in one way or another within this public sphere. But this is something that does not or is not accepted when we are talking about this uh, uh, the issue of comparative advantage. So we find a shift now, I think, towards a new mode of um, division of labor, division of labor, separation of labor, and as well separation of power. Inside and outside um, is changing in different ways. The nation state takes a different form as well as the state itself 
takes a different position in the entire system. All this had not uh, had been more or less clear cut up to a certain stage, I say and emphasize more or less, but today we are facing a more pronounced blurring of the borders. The global village, that's the one of the catchwords, and this brings up the nations, uh, the, the, the value chains, the idea of value chains, where everything is immediately linked in the calculation. This is an important part. In the calculation, it's not just taken uh, from others, but it is a part of an immediate inclusion into this, I hesitate, capitalist process. I hesitate because it, of, of, it is, of course, still the matter of inequality of power, of excess. Anyway, everybody adds values in the family, in the community, and now in this global village. One of the main problems in economic terms is that we are facing a decoupling of production and finance. And actually we are uh, facing a decoupling of money and finance, even, that finance today, the financial industries today, are not really dealing with money. Saskia Sassen uh, is working for some time on this and makes it clear that the entire finance system is not about money. You are not looking for more money, but even having debt and buying debt from others uh, is hugely uh, profitable. Again, something I don't want to get uh, and cannot go into details here. Um, but it, of course, plays a role as well when we look at the entire matter of uh, productivity, the role of V, variable capital and constant capital. And if we look at many descriptions or analysis even of the digital economy, we find exactly this strange thing um, that actually one never can, can really know what produces in inverted commerce uh, the value. Why are these things so valuable as they are expressed in money? Part of the explanation is, I think, that all these systems capitalism, classical capitalism, on whichever state, is never a pure system. It's always a system uh, of the variety of capitalism, not in the sense as the variety of managing capitalist enterprises. This is the main strength of the discussion of a variety of capitalism, but it is the variety of capitalism. It's a mixed system where we have the pure capitalist elements around producing surplus value, but where we have as well other things, because for instance, even there we find the meaning of family work, family labor, uh, is not considered, not properly considered. Rosa Luxemburg said this in the way that she said, the internal market is from the perspective of the capitalist production, the capitalist market, and then we find the external market, which is for the capital, the non-capitalist social environment. This is the wider understanding of this consensus of these lifestyles, modes of life, uh, and, this, and things like that is important for this. And then we have uh, the scientific technical process, uh, progress, sorry, uh, where we have the productive factors, scientific pro, uh, progress is about productive factors, not as a source of value, but only as a means of realization, and as such as a means of depreciation of a capital. How does the, all this work? Of course, the most extreme of this depreciation is war, it's violence, it's pure 
disjunction, plain disjunction. It is, of course, as well about utilizing market advantage. It's about rationalization. Um, it is about the economies of scale, the massification of production. It's about increasing productivity. And it is not least about the externalization of cost. Other capital bearing the cost, the state, the future, the rest of the world. And it is as well about these moments we find increasingly important today of a charitableization, meaning charities, the tables, all this welfare going on, because this is the only way that people actually can survive. All other means um, are not working, and are not working because the part of the wealth is financialized, it disappears, taxes are not paid, subventions are given, um, but there is exactly not a capitalist system even within the capitalist system. This has huge implications for the capital structure as well. It is about the reduction of the share of C, of the constant capital, making machines, at least in relative terms, more uh, productive, cheaper. It is as well here a depreciation or privatization that is especially relevant in the gig economy and the sharing economy, that people use their own private means to be part of this uh, economic process. It is about, as well, the massification of luxury, luxury process uh, products, um, that all the, the top brands, the top gadgets, are now affordable for everybody, of course not for everybody really, but for an increasing number of people. It's about shifting inferior normal and superior goods uh, and making actually the so-called babbling goods increasingly normal. It's about startups where money is not necessarily invested for profit, it's not invested uh, to really make profit with these enterprises, but it is invested as a means of um, getting specific rates on taxes. It is about uh, financialization. It is about short-term profit that then can be uh, referred to other means and uh, entering a circular process until the bubble bursts. It is, a, uh, it is a reduction of, um, of, of the share of uh, V, of the variable capital. This is part of the sharing economy, that actually leasing a car is at the end of the day somewhat cheaper than buying always a new car. Sharing is in relative terms cheaper than buying uh, the goods. And here again we find charitableization. So we have different processes there. As I said before, we have as well self-help, we have hedonist social engagement for those who can afford it. Um, we have DIY, uh, not least as a kind of enforced process. If I cannot buy the goods, if I want to have the goods, I refer to this. Um, and of course, we have the very traditional means of uh, manipulation of working time, uh, monopolization, establishment of, ca uh, of cartels. Um, one important factor here is as well that the differentiation of the rate of profit plays a huge role. And this is important as well, read the words of Nietzsche, um, the, the differential, differential accumulation, 
um, that he actually looks towards a new uh, new political economy, that we have this um, new ways of uh, influencing the rate of profit in some areas uh, where we manipulate the C and the, the relationship between C and V by reducing V artificially, reducing the necessary, the socially necessary labor time, and increase in this way V, the variable capital, in relation to C. It's again something that is easy to calculate. And it is again something, if we look in the wider context on this topic, we find the value chain, we find the supply chain, it's more or less a technical, logistical process, and we find the poverty chain. As I said, there is no win-win uh, situation. The value gained on the one side of the chain is the increasing poverty on the other side of uh, this equation of the chain. The, the entire new features of this economy, sharing and gig economy and all this stuff, uh, it's, it's pretty difficult to grasp, as I think. And there are different proposals uh, towards the classification. Of course, this is about the standard issues of use value, exchange value. It is about the availability and accessibility, its limited choice. It is about understanding what it really means. It's not just the economic issue. How, how do I perceive what am I doing as driver of a car of a bike, is it just a job for me, is it part of my income, or is it really something that I enjoy to do because I like sharing, actually. There's as well, of course, this issue of anxiety, of enemy, of limits to government. And we have to look at it in the different contexts, uh, of a political system, of the polities, I outline it here, of the polities of a matter of citizens, and we have of course this very general understanding of citizens, but we have at the same time there a, even a rough difference between the citizen of the society, the citoyen, probably the nearest to the understanding in the French Revolution, the political citizen. Um, Marshall discussed this, Tony Marshall discussed this with his different rights. And then we have uh, the, again the, the market citizen playing a major role. And this, of course, links um, this, this sharing economy and the new digital, digitized. Uh, economies as well in different terms towards a community tool, towards uh, government and governance tool, and towards a business tool, a business model. I think this is difficult, but at the same time this is something where we have to live with this difficulty of having different forms, different ways of working hand in hand or not, but at least existing at the same time. Um, business model parameters there would be, for instance, by Tadoli Seniors uh, outlined uh, something of less labor dependency, because you don't have to employ people in a permanent job. It's a huge degree, a high degree of, of flexibility. Um, the seasonal worker in extenso. Then we have a matter of um, the, the economies of scale. They hugely matter. On the, on the one hand, you need uh, the, the services you provide within this framework. Uh, 
it, it only makes sense if it's on a large scale. And at the same time, um, with this even exponential growth, you have something else that you actually use less and less uh, workforce to do the to do the job in terms of fixed employment. It's easy to globalize. Uh, bike sharing, uh, all these things that can be you uh, they, they can be done anywhere on the world, more or less. Uh, there are some legal issues. There is culture. There are moral issues. But by and large, uh, we we can say it's easy to globalize uh, these parts of the economy, and it is uh, something where the databases we use or that are used are actually more than databases. It's not just a collection of databases, but they are more, they are uh, developing according to their own rules, the own rules being, of course, something that is not generally own, uh, but is uh, part of uh, a wider concept of um, a strategy, uh, business strategy. Another form of classification is to look at the at, at, at the different features that had been done in the report for the European um, Commission uh, from NASTA. It's the resources, the assets that are used. It's the relationship between user and platform, where one never can be sure who is actually the user. Uh, is it the driver for such a service like user, like, like Uber? Is it uh, the, the customer who actually drives the passenger? Um, or is it actually Uber itself that utilizes the service of uh, drivers and, um, and the passengers? It is the direct end user interaction that plays a role. Again, we have the, the, the difficulty to determine who is the, uh, who, who is the end user. It's the scale of operations, and it is the type of digital economy, di digital uh, technology, sorry. Now, another approach to the classification is on the political function. If we say there are digital entrepreneurs, taking this understanding of the entrepreneur in, in a wider sense, we may say these are entrepreneurs for political, for societal change. They don't want to continue uh, the way societies work. They want really societal change, including the entire economic system, including the mechanisms of utilism, of valuation, realizing, uh, adding value. We have societal reform models using um, the, the digital economy, the different strands of the di digital economy for reform, for instance, to make the welfare state more effective. Then we have a kind of complementary system um, where we have public services, where we have social security, where we have infrastructure, also private businesses, using this as something they can fall back on, they use as complement in terms of advertisement uh, for their own service. So you have a railway service providing at the same time uh, sh car sharing and bike sharing and accommodation and all that. Not so much different from older forms of concentration and um, centralization of capital. And then we have, of course, this matter of individual uh, functioning, enhancing individual functioning. Uh, again, two sides to this, enhancing or uh, adapting to what is going on education, training, getting used to it, being faster than others, making your life a little bit easier, at least it seems to be. Empty. 
The political systemic classification, I think, is the most difficult in some way, because we find definitely trends that I would consider as a process of refeudalization on a higher level. We find ways of capitalization, a more or less advanced form of primitive accumulation. We find strategies that are actually just muddling through, uh, which cannot be classified in the strict sense of uh, as, as a political system, but nevertheless it is a political systemic uh, approach uh, that there is no strategy behind it, that it is just a matter of getting along, surviving the next day, the next week, the next year. And then we have this general process of a clandestine or open process of socialization. Socialization in different forms, socialization in terms of appropriating uh, the entire society, again, for one's own use. Now, as I said, G20, the slogan was of, of shaping the world, but it was not on sharing the world. Um, it is something where we find actually this idea of shaping the world uh, in a wider process of trying to find different property structures and considering as well the idea of global solidarity. Global, meaning global and not amongst a small number of people, but looking as well at the property structures that are developing in this context. Briefly referring to Eleanor Ostrom uh, with the different dimensions, the common pool resources, the commonly owned, commonly controlled, commonly administered uh, resources we have, not goods, but something that we all use. Then we have the public goods that are used, defining these uh, issues as goods, but in the interest of the public. And then we have private goods uh, that are appropriating this further, making it private, and then we have the kind of mixture in between the toll goods that also play a role and that play a role in terms of uh, exactly dealing with the different forms or different dimensions of what we have. Data information, are these public goods, are these actually common uh, pool resources, the data as such are there. They are just produced by living, by doing something, and it is only a question of how they are um, enclosed, how they are appropriate in private, semi-private, or which way or the way. It is about producing the data, but it is as well about what do we do with them. Are we producing, are we using them for producing a public good, a private in, uh, good, a general interest good, or something like this? I think we have to be careful with it, and we have to be more uh, precise as well when it comes to the legal issues. Um, it may be that it's not by accident. Most of the debate is about labor security, labor law, and uh, detailed issues of property rights. And I do not want in any way to, de uh, to, to refuse the importance or, or to decline uh, saying that this is not important. But what I think is typical that in France, we find a little bit of different orientation that we have on the highest level a uh, body that is called Conseil Economique Social et Environnemental. And this body 
is actually looking at the complex issue of uh, the digital economy in terms of the public interest. France, there is the tradition of the strong meaning as we have in France. Back to capital structures, we have the traditional structure, capital C and related to V, and if we look on the global level uh, at it, I think we can say so far that we have in the emerging economy uh, the, the main orientation still, or very strong orientation still, on the traditional mass production uh, low wages. This is changing, this is definitely changing, and this is changing uh, rapidly. And in some areas we find even an overtaking uh, taking place. Still, I dare to ask if we have a kind of uh, structure, global structure, click in the east and gig in the west. Is there a link? between this new emerging economic patterns uh, where we have click farms, where we have the production of cheap goods, uh, with all the computer-aided means of production, and we have gig in the West as a kind of sourcing it out, uh, leaving it to the individual to solve his or her own uh, problems. These are different uh, or difficult issues to deal with and it's difficult not least as we face this uh, problem of capital structures always standing behind it. This is the main thing where we have the, to, to look at what globally is happening actually to the capital structures. And what are, is happening to the capital structure? Here I come back to what we had been talking about before. Um, see, we is the main issue, it's at the center. And it is at the center, not least in terms of uh, looking at the issue of the different capitals relating to each other and being organized in the most profitable, profitable uh, way. Profitable, not necessarily most productive. So at the end of the day we want to have more capital. What we require, and it is of course a political uh, question, what we will require is actually a recentering, moving the entire calculation towards VC that the important is not the production of capital, but it is the production of V. And there, of course, uh, we see that V, labor force, labor power, is a fictitious um, commodity. It is not the real commodity in terms of being produced or a further market uh, to be sold, to be traded on the market. It is something different. And this is something where we can say the increase, the development of V is about the development of humankind, of personalities, of something more that is of course linked to something else, namely uh, to something how we interact um, when it comes to exchange processes and all this, but where we have something that is 
very different from the original meaning of capital. So just in a brief side remark, I have my problems as well when it comes to Bourdieu, who says uh, we have the different forms of capital. We have of the form of capital. But still, I think it makes sense to say we have to reorient the entire process towards development of V instead of increasing C. The socio-individual reproduction, the social reproduction, all this playing a role. Money, of course, playing a role, but money now being really reduced to be an instrument in this entire process. What we find today, where we have data understood as a means to increase C, to increase profit, to increase capital, is something else. And there we find actually that we are live by data and that it is not really about uh, using data. They are used sometimes in our favor, very favorable, who would say a GPS uh, navigation system is not helpful. Uh, anyway, it is something different. But this is the famous story of Adams, um, where he says, the, or the computer actually says, the solution, the answer to everything is 42. That's the idea of deep thought, this supercomputer, who, after a long period of time, comes to this conclusion. But if you ever read this story, the problem there is that the question was not clear at all. So this was the next task then to develop a computer, a new supercomputer, and this uh, finally turned out to be the planet Earth. It is about exponential growth of data as such pretty useful, useless, and it is on the other hand about a static society um, that had been developed or that had been ventilated in, in many instances for a long time. Uh, you, again, Aristotle, Xenophon, uh, all these people dealing with this. Uh, Mills, uh, then later with the beginning of modern economic thinking. Um, John Maynard Keynes, of course. Uh, Vasily Leontiev as well, uh, and all actually coming down or coming back to this process, uh, what is human being about? There we find actually the statement by Mills, it is better to be a human uh, being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Better Socrates dissatisfied uh, than a fool satisfied. So far, so good. But he said as well, and if the fool or the pig is of different opinion, it is only because they only knew their own side of the question. So we have to look a little bit further when it comes to uh, the new developments of digitalized economy. We have to look at the potentials and we have to look at the real processes behind it in terms of changing capital structures. Briefly at the end, conclusions. Are we really talking about value? Are we not talking about money or wealth and its distribution? Also, what is the structure of capital we have in mind and what, uh, that we look at in terms of the productive parts, in terms of uh, the different parts of the capital? And what are the contradictions uh, in this? And the contradictions are, of course, as well, 
I think we have to see this in those who are at the top and where I sometimes think it's just a fool, uh, a fooling uh, with, for instance, an innovation council where the largest uh, capitalists are sitting and, and uh, suggesting we are overcoming um, capitalism. And it is as well something where we have to look at the contradiction, try to make sense out of it, being honest about it, being open, but nevertheless look at the um, systemic pushes that are uh, there and that are necessary and possible. It may be that we end up with politically very strange situations and uh, links, but at the same time, for the time being, at least, we have to at least we have to ventilate what this is really about. In any case, we have to be careful. I think um, that we are looking at some parts where in a feudalizing way we face this shift from a capitalism for that capitalist rules actually don't exist. If we look at many of the main players we may be surprised even on the behavioral level uh, how it is possible in a civilized world that people behave in this way. New relevant questions in political science, in economics, we still are very much uh, oriented to this trilemma proposed by Roderick, uh, saying it is uh, the inescapable, uh, inescapable trilemma of the world economy, the, um, where, where we have the democracy, where we have national sovereignty, and where we have global uh, economic integration, they, go, they don't go together. My question would be, are they supposed to go together today? Aren't we beyond the traditional forms of democracy? Aren't we beyond the traditional form of national sovereignty? And aren't we really arriving at global economic integration instead of a world systems um, a system that is based on inequality, on inequality of power and excess. It is something where we have to be more detailed in our analysis, where we have to overcome these issues of nation states and parliamentary democracy and of course this plays a, a role as well when we are talking about the gross domestic product as the ultimate uh, standard for our economic development. Say, we are talking about G20, IMF, trade agreements. This means as well that we have to look at new forms of interpretation and we have to go beyond purely technical approaches in this respect. It's about a balance sheet that we have to look at and a new form of a balance sheet. It is about the total output, not only in terms of the domestic output, but in terms of the global output. And it is about the output not only in terms of commodities, but in the wider sense. There are, I think, new niches, there are new opportunities for truly uh, sound understanding uh, of, of uh, new forms of um, growth, of development. So I come back to the formula of Z, uh, of, sorry, of, of C to V and ask if you are turning it around and say it's about B to C, are we actually striving still for the traditional way of growth or is it the entire uh, model that changes? Requirements, condition for it, 
we have to overcome methodological individualism, and we have to overcome methodological nationalism. Living labor is something that is important, and even if I say it is the economy that matters, it's, it's the basic that matters, I think law will play a major role there. It is something where many issues have been discussed before, by Marx, by Luxembourg, by Hilferding, by Lenin, also by Keynes, by Galbraith, John Kenneth, and it is uh, by James discussed today. It is discussed today as well as matter of philosophy, Horkheimer, Weber, the Iron Cage, for a long time, coming up again and again. And I think we are far away from a digital scene that may replace an Anthropocene and a capitalist scene. We are far away from this. We are still thinking, I have to say this now, uh, alluding to this famous story with Kant, we have to get away from the Kantian imperative and we have to arrive at a new Kant, if we want, a new Kant that is leaving the house not only at a certain hour and not always with the umbrella and not followed by Mr. Lampe, but that is free in its own way and can develop new potentials against others to arrive new, at a new stage of activities. It's a long story, I know it's complicated, it had been many basic things, really very basic things. At the same time it is important uh, to look at these issues, to keep them in mind when we are talking about individual enterprises, individual projects and their potential development. So thank you very much and I hope it is uh, enough for further discussions. C'est la lutte finale pour pour nous et demain l'international sera le genre humain Ces paroles qui trottent dans la tête des opprimés du monde entier sont celles d'un de nos poètes qui s'appelait Eugène Potier Aujourd'hui le monde a changé Est-ce qu'il y a moins d'exploités, de chômeurs, d'enfants affamés, pour qu'on puisse se reposer, de chanter, de chanter, de chanter, de chanter, c'est la lutte finale, groupons-nous et demain. Le genre humain